Um, I hopefully everybody can see this now perfectly. And yep. um, Okay, so I'm going to be talking about tensor, uh, magnetic tensor-based modeling. Um, and this was basically a lot of uh, what I did on my PhD. Um, so hopefully um, it all goes to plan. Um, okay, so um, can you see properly or is it look, does it look strange on your screen? Does it look fine? Uh, it comes through, comes through well. Um, okay, great. Issues on, on my side. Okay, fine. So basically what the talk is going to do is um, at the root of all of this is tensors and in particular magnetic tensor data. And I'm going to be looking at two aspects of it. The one is to look at source distance equations. And if you're familiar with Gordon Cooper's work, then you'll recognize a, a whole lot of these equations. And then there will be an example on that, an application of that. So that's, that's the one side of things. And that's where I'm going to start with. And then the other side of things I want to look at um, what we can do, uh, some of the things I worked on to do with remnants um, in tensor data, and then having a look at an example about that. So without any further um, delay, let's get cracking. So basically, chances are you've already been using tensors. I kind of think this is a bit funny because, you know, we did scalars and vectors and matrices and stuff, and all of a sudden tensors come along and say, oh, yeah, no, we, we're all of those things. So a rank naught tensor is basically just a scalar. A rank one tensor is a vector, and a rank two tensor is a matrix. It carries on up like that, but the rank that we're interested in is this rank two tensor because that's the one um, where a magnetic gradient tensor is defined. So if we look at the magnetic gradient tensor, it's basically just a matrix with a, lot, a whole lot of um, gradients in it. So you can see, um, I'm just going, you can see, uh, I'm just trying to see. Um, okay, can you see my, um, I'm wondering how I can, oh, I see, okay. We can see the equations. Okay, so if you can see over here um, on the top row of this series of equations, you'll see that it's the X component of the field, which is BX, and then it just takes the derivatives of all of those things. But because this is kind of cumbersome to write it out that way, um, on the right hand side over here, you can actually see that the, there's a nice and neater shorthand. So if we see, say, BXX, it's basically the X derivative of the X component and so forth. So um, in terms of tensors, they have a couple of neat properties. Because of the fact that we're dealing with second derivatives of a scalar potential, then it turns out that everything on the top of the diagonal is mirrored on the bottom of the diagonal. Okay, So yx is equal to xy and zx is equal to xz. These are kind of neat properties because it means that on a practical point of view, if, you're, if you are um, calculating derivatives and stuff like that manually, and you feel like, say, for example, say, finding the z derivative of something might create problems you and you you might actually want to swap it around so for example sake if you don't like calculating the z derivative of, it, of x you can always calculate the x derivative of the z component and it makes kind of things on a, on a programming point of view it makes it actually kind of nice and reduces some of the problems that you might have um i don't have it on the slide as well but another property that's useful is that um the Z, the ZZ component is equal to the negative of the YY component minus the XX component. So these things are also mirrored and that also simplifies some equations later on. So um, I'm just mentioning here, but these tensors also have invariants and these are, um, these are quantities that um, remain constant under a basis change. Uh, I don't really deal with this, but um, on an interpretation point of view, it's one of the quantities that you can actually calculate. And you can see these equations just basically you multiply these particular tensors together to get the invariance. So um, in terms of interpretation, the different components and tensors actually re, um, relate to different things, and they, they're largely things that you would expect. So, for example, say they might look primarily at east-west east -west boundaries or north-south boundaries, and if you see the data later on, you'll see that they tend to pick up certain features on the bodies a little bit better and other features not so better. So, they, they're kind of, they're, on that point of view, you could use them for, for sort of delineating selective um, features or whatever. Um, the tensor invariance, um, resolve source boundaries or maybe look at shallower features rather than complex sources. Um, so, um, so now what I'd like to do is start getting with that bit of background, I'll get into source distances. So source distance calculations are basically a, a category of inverse modeling and they, they seek to overcome the non-uniqueness and time efficiency challenges by simplifying the problem. So they're, one, they're a way to actually try to, to make an inverse model very, very fast. Um, but they do that um, by um, simplifying things a lot. 
which actually could be a problem in some instances if you if you make the wrong model of assumptions or whatever. So they so what they do basically is they they will um, assume some geometries like you're dealing with a dike or you're dealing with a, um, a step or something like that, and then they will seek to to target certain things like the depth to the dike or or um, or susceptibility of the dike or something like that. So that's what they do, and because they, you make assumptions like that, you can actually calculate things very very fast. So many of us have probably used these things before, and they include things like Werner deconvolution, the Nordi method, Euler deconvolution, and the analytic signal. And these things are found commonly in many packages that we use. Um, so the source distance detection methods that I'm going to be using um, use the analytic signal. And um, there are different um, orders of analytic signal that you can get. And the ones that I've used are the zero, the first, and the second order analytic signal. Um, and so I've just got the equations here, just in case you're interested. But basically, the zero order analytic signal uses the total magnetic intensity and then Hilbert transforms of the total magnetic intensity in the x and y directions. The first order analytic signal is the one that we all sort of love and know. And they're basically the x, y, and z derivatives of whatever you're taking um, in this case, the normal analytic signal would be the total magnetic intensity. And if we want to go for the second order signal, then this is where these relationships that I've discussed earlier come in neat, uh, neatly. And you can actually find the derivative of these um, mathematically and the equations come out, as you can see over here, they're quite straightforward and simple to confirm. And ultimately, after that, the second order of the analytical signals, basically the derivatives of the first order of the analytic signals. Then And these orders actually carry on up like that. So once you've got the one sort of locked in, then you can actually carry on up. But now, the disadvantage of higher orders of these analytic signals is obviously that the, the more derivatives that you have to calculate, the more noisy, the more the noise has an impact on your models and things like that. So um, I wanted to just also mention here as, a, as, a, as an aside, um, in uh, when you're calculating the total magnetic intensity, you can actually calculate it in terms of the X and Y and Z components. And um, this alpha, beta, and gamma, they're called direction cosines. And you can see on the on the graph on the right hand side, that basically the cosine of C would be um, would be gamma, and the cosine of A would be alpha, and so forth. And they're an indication of the direction of the field. So you can use this equation, and it's quite nice and simple and neat on a mathematical point of view, just to say alpha times B X plus beta times B Y and whatever. And if you want to take derivatives of that, then that's the equation that comes up below that. But it's important to note that when you, if you, if you look into this and you, from your own point of view or your own self, um, they don't. This is, approximation doesn't work really well for strong anomalies. It doesn't. It's not good enough. So for the for a, a better version of the equation is what I've given here below. It's much longer, a bit more complicated, and you can immediately see that a consequence of that is that the resulting um, second z derivative of the equation gets a lot more complicated. So now and the only reason I'm mentioning this is that often if I in one or two instances if I display an equation, they're going to be the simple form of the equation only because it would be a little bit overwhelming to put massively long equations on the on the talk, but but I did actually calculate with both. Ultimately, though, um, you should really, if you're programming this up, you should probably use the full equation because there's no real reason to use the simpler equation, especially with math languages such as Python and Maxima. So, for those of you that are not so familiar, Python is a programming language much like much like uh, MATLAB, except it's it's much better. Um, <laughs> And uh, Maxima is, is one of these languages that you can use to solve equations and things like that. And it's one of the things that I used when I was dealing with this because I, I wasn't crazy enough to try to do all of this on my own. Okay, so onto the source distance method. So now if you've been to Gordon's talks and things like that, this might look familiar to you. So um, he showed in 2014, he published a paper where he showed that you can take the ratio of um, two analytic signals, the first order and the second order, and you multiply them by this factor n plus one, where n is a, is a kind of an index. And depending on what you have as n, it refers to a different source type. So if it's n zero, then you're dealing with a contact or a step. If it's one, it's a vertical dike and so forth. So, um, and using this, you can actually get a depth down to the source, which is R, okay? Um, the nice thing about these equations like this is that you can get a, a very quick sense of what you're dealing with very fast. Um, and then you can use that as input to any other uh, modeling or whatever, if you wanna take it further. So when you're dealing with tensors, the, the, the logical thing is to actually substitute tensor versions of the analytic signal into these equations and see what effect that they have. 
So here is a calculated tensor field. This was um, a forward modeled field. It's just a simple cube. And um, you can immediately see um, the, the different uh, relationships between the different tensor variables. So I'll just go through it quickly. Here at the bottom left-hand corner is the total magnetic intensity. So this is the field that you would we would normally be seeing in our normal data. Um, and on the, the top three um, maps are basically just the X, Y, and Z components of the field. And then as you go into the different tensor um, components, um, you can start to see how each component actually only looks at certain aspects of the body. And if you remember when I said that they are symmetrical, these are symmetrical, there's, that's the reason why you own, only see um, over here six grids or components, because the other three at the bottom would be identical to E, F, and H. So these are just some quick results to, to just to illustrate how um, well the source, this um, depth source works. So this is over here, you can see these are the two analytic signals that were used in A and B, the first and second order signals. And at the bottom, you can actually see the calculated depths and over the areas where the peaks show, the, they actually um, get reasonably good depths in this particular case. So now to apply this with, um, with um, tensors, it turns out that um, um, especially if you've been look, reading the paper by Nabigian in 1972, um, that the, the, the source distance equations actually are valid for total vertical and horizontal fields. They don't, they're not just only for the total field. Uh, and obviously, unless you've, this doesn't really mean much if you don't have uh, really good tensor data because that's what you would have. So, so you can actually start to substitute tensor components into the actual source um, equations. So in this particular case, um, the analytic signal is re with respect to say the, the X component of the field and it, it comprises um, X tensor, tensor components. And um, so these three and so forth, this is the Y version and this is the Z version. And so um, there are equations that you can use for these different analytic signals comprising tensor data. It's quite straightforward and it, they basically are the same as what you had before, except that you have inputs that are tensor components. Um, and as a result, Immediately, we have three different um, versions of the um, solution that we can that we can now calculate with tensor data. The other thing that you can do is you can have a look at another version of the source detection routine. Um, in 2015, um, Gordon demonstrated that you could use the zero order and the first order analytic signal um, to calculate the depth as well. And the advantage of this is that it's more stable in terms of noise. The zero and the first order um, analytic signal don't have as high derivatives as you would get with the second order analytic signal, so it's less susceptible to noise. So, um, and as a result of that, you can see some tensor versions of these um, equations that I've got over here. And you can actually even interchange the different directions of the tensor version. So here you can see the first order is X and the second order was Z. And um, that might be useful um, if you want to look at certain directions. I didn't investigate this too much, but, um, but it I definitely has um, possibilities if you're looking for certain directions and orientations. Also, sometimes the coupling of the tensor might not work very well for certain of the tensor components with the feature that you're going. Kind of like um, your line direction and it makes a big difference if it's perpendicular to your feature or whatever. And, you know, I think that it will be similar for some of the tensor components. So um, it is also possible with these source detection, source um, calculation routines to calculate other things like um, the, the susceptibility and the width. They normally come together in this particular equation. Um, you, you need to know one or the other. If you want to know the susceptibility, you need to know the width of the feature that you're dealing with and vice versa. Um, the width is not such a big deal in many cases because um, you can easily estimate the width using say an analytic signal or something like that. You can come up with a ballpark figure and then have the uh, starting order um, for your, for your um, susceptibility. So um, in both of these cases, though, you need the depth, but this is not a big deal since we just calculated the depth using some of the other equations. And um, so that's not such a big issue. So if I look at, use these equations now, and I put them into a model over here, you can see here we have a step and a dike. So on the left-hand side, I have a step. And the step uh, doesn't work for the zero order in the first order analytic signal equation because that equation just has n and n at zero just cancels everything else out. So that may be the answer to one of the questions that might be posed like, why do we use the other versions if this one's so nice in terms of noise? And the answer is because it doesn't always work with every type of feature. Um, 
but otherwise um, the the solutions actually are quite um, are quite stable. If we look on the right hand side, now we're dealing with a dike, um, and now both of the solutions can actually be used. And here the 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 zero order solution seemed to be better and actually got a better solution in this particular case for the top of the dike. So um, they both give slightly varying results depending on what feature you're looking at and what equations are going in. So, it, you know, I think it depends a little bit in terms of the calculation as well, but there are lots of possibilities here. So just showing you how robust they are in terms of noise. Um, over here, I have, um, I think this is just the analytic signal of the, or of the data. And then at the bottom, you can actually see that you can clearly see where the feature is. And it seems to be sort of fairly um, um, robust against any kind of noise calculation, but this is noise feed data. So I suppose that makes a lot of sense. On the right hand side, we added noise. Okay. And, um, and down below, you can clearly see now that now it looks like a mess. Okay. But it's not really a mess because you're not using this technique to actually find the feature. You already know where the feature is. There are better ways to find features than actually um, than using a source detection technique. So even if you just looked at, say, the analytic signal to look at the technique and we see, oh, okay, there's the technique here. Suddenly we know more or less where to look and the noisy bit of the data doesn't really make much of a difference and the technique is still robust enough to find out what you're looking for. So I think in a way... Um, don't be put off on the left and right hand side of the dike because um, by the noise there, because that's not actually a part of what we're considering at all. Okay, um, so utilizing all of these things, I wanted to just do a quick demonstration of this on some real data or some data as real as I could make it. And um, I wanted to do this over an area in South Africa, which we, which we um, know. Um, and but the problem is that I didn't have any access to South African data, which is, um, which is understandable. The, this data is, is, um, is, you know, it's owned by other companies and that's their proprietary data. So, um, so I had to calculate the tensor data synthetically. Now it is possible to calculate tensor data from total magnetic intensity data. Okay. And so, and in that way, you can calculate up your tensor data sets. But the thing is, and this I found very interesting, is that um, there seems to be, in my opinion anyway, a misconception about this calculation. In that, um, that, that uh, there's a perception that this calculation that can perfectly um, um, simulate tensor data, and it's actually not true. The, the problem with this calculation is that it doesn't at all account for remnants, because the calculation involved needs you need to know the direction cosines of the field. And if you don't know what the remnants in the field is, then all you have is the standard thing that you look up. And so you, so you don't get the correction right. So at the bottom here, I just show this, I illustrate this. Um, you can see this dashed line is the total magnetic intensity. And if there's no remnants, then the calculated version of the Z um, component works perfectly. Everything is wonderful. Brilliant. But as soon as I added remnants to this field, as you can see now, the anomaly is quite different. Um, the calculated derived Z component is wrong. Okay, so this doesn't really matter for my current test because I'm not looking at remnants yet. Um, but in the next section, it will matter because you can't actually um, deal with remnants in a calculated field. This is very good news for people like Spectrum because it means that that all of their measuring is actually really, really important because there is stuff that you measure in the aircraft that can't be simulated, in my opinion, any other way. And that means that, and that's kind of exciting for tensor data because it means that we can get value out of the data that you just can't get outside of measuring it directly. So now the other thing that I need is to do following peaks because obviously I want to put a grid in and I want this to actually be a kind of an automated process. I don't actually want to manually pick a little feature and, and do things manually. Peak following is kind of easy and well understood. Um, I just did this in Python and the way I did it was to you get routines that will find, um, you know, peaks and troughs and and just extract them out of whatever layer you've got and produce um, another image. So on the right hand side, you can actually see there's a whole lot of peak locations doing this. And then, but more than that, if you remember from the earlier, some of the earlier slides, I, I have to know what feature I'm calculating. Am I dealing with a dike or am I dealing with a, something that's like a plug or whatever? So if I'm dealing with dikes and I want dikes then I need to filter out all these little point sources over here. That's quite easy as well to do automatically. I used a routine called dbscan. It's a type of clustering algorithm. And how it works is it basically, um, links up everything that's very close to everything else. So using dbscan, I could actually use a threshold to say, 
if there are less than a certain amount of things linked together, then it's obviously not a dike and I could just fill them all up. So this is what I did. It was a nice way to actually just extract only the solutions out that linked to dikes and nothing else. So getting on to the interpretation, um, I looked at the Lichtenberg Zerist um, area, which is in the Northwest province. And I'm actually really just interested in the dikes in this area. Um, so you can see a whole lot of dikes in the area and let's see what we can get out of that. So here are the derived tensor components for this area. Just as before, as you saw in the synthetic example, the top three maps are basically the X, Y, and Z component. This bottom left-hand uh, map is the total magnetic intensity from which everything was derived. And here we can see the different X, um, different tensor components. You can clearly see that if we, if you want to derive tensor components and you're not worried about remnants at all, then it works fine. Um, and um, these are some depth to source results that we started. I'm going to show you these two first. On the left-hand side, it's a standard analytic signal um, ratio. And on the right-hand side, I've got a, a tensor version. Um, the only thing that's important is the solutions over the dikes. Nothing else is really that important. It's not going to be right anyway. And they show similar solutions if you look at the colors over the areas of interest. So I was actually reasonably happy with how that worked. Of course, I used much more than just this set of equations. So, and I'll show you that just now. This is a susceptibility result. In the same way, please ignore everything that's not on a dike. It's not really relevant. Only the bits on the dikes were actually useful to this exercise. But this is how the whole map looks. And so here are some of the, the um, results for the different methods. And you can actually see over here, some of them are actually a little bit noisier. That makes sense. We have the second order analyst signal. So that makes a lot of, that makes it a lot of noise. And some of the other directions of um, the tensors worked better than, than what we had for the first direction. Then uh, this is the second one. Well, this is the more noise-free version because we have zero order analytic signals and that also produced fa fairly stable results. Um, um, the bottom one is the one that say comes just straight out of Gordon's work. Um, so that actually seems to line up pretty nicely. On the right-hand side, I have um, a susceptibility calculation that would have, where I had to assume the width of the dikes. And here is a map with the peak locations. And there are less, um, points here that I've, I've filtered out. And on the right-hand side, I overlay the susceptibilities according to the dikes. Immediately, if you look at this, you can see some trends here. Firstly, you can see that these susceptibilities line up pretty well along these dark features. So you can actually see this continuity there in the solutions. And then there seems to be two sort of distinct features, the dark blue ones, and then these lighter sort of mixed, more mixed features that come out as a different sort of dark. Maybe they were came different, were intruded differently or, or whatever. So as a simple um, way of actually looking at that, I decided just to split them up into terms of the susceptibilities. Everything with a susceptibility lower than a certain amount, I assign to one set of dikes and everything with a susceptibility higher than another amount, I assign to another dike, because then I'm going to forward model those dikes. And this is the model that I came, that, that was produced um, as a 3D model. Um, and you can see here the two, um, the colors, or relate to the susceptibilities that I assigned earlier. And so the whole process has made quite a neat um, model where you can clearly see um, different sort of dikes having clearly very distinct but continuous susceptibilities quite neatly. Here are the profile results. So over here, you can see the profiles going north south. And um, on the right hand side, what's input into this is this bottom slide here where you can actually see the depths that have been put in and the, the blue depths and the, the, or the blue dikes are different to the red dikes in terms of the susceptibilities that were calculated. You can see the depth calculations, uh, which were used to create these models. And then that was actually input into a forward model process to see how well it actually modeled compared to the real data. And it doesn't look too bad in some cases. So I was actually kind of happy about that. In places where it doesn't line up perfectly, it's probably um, due to say either the width of the dike not being the, the assumption for width and susceptibility not being correct, or perhaps it's actually a little bit more complicated than the model that I had. But then in, even in that case, the source, the, the source techniques are still useful because you can use it as a starting point for another technique. So with that being said, I'm, I'm going to start moving over to the remnant side of the, the, the talk. And this, I actually kind of found this the most interesting because I kind of think that this is an area that is definitely useful um, to be studied more in terms of um, tensor data because of the fact that the measured data itself has remnant information that you can't calculate any other way. Um, and so um, 
I looked into this because I wanted to see how much we could actually get out of the remnant information out of tense information that you can't see in normal total magnetic total magnetic intensity data. Um, so yeah, um, because in the case of a normal TMI data set, you you have to assume things. You have to either measure in a in a uh, in a physical properties laboratory, things like your susceptibility and your directions and your and magnetizations and everything like that, and then use it in your models. You, you know, or you have to assume stuff like that. So over here, the direction cosines that I talked about earlier, the total field direction cosines, they're the combined remnant and ambient um, field direction cosines. So they're an indication of the total direction of the field and um, at any single point. OK, so the good thing about these direction cosines is they can be calculated using tensor data and that makes no assumptions whatsoever. OK, so that's quite an important thing. You're not assuming susceptibility or magnetization or depth or anything like that. It just takes in the tensor data. Um, these equations, these direction cosines can actually be used in equations um, for, for magnetization and susceptibility to, to determine the remnant vector direct, uh, direction, but they make but as you'll see later, they, they uh, make assumptions about some of the things. So um, that may not actually be as good in every situation. So a simple form of the equations is as follows. Yes, that's the simple form. And, um, but you can see that they only have um, the, the um, tensor data in them. If you remember earlier on, I mentioned this different difference between the approximate field and the, the full field. So this is the approximate field version. Um, the full field version is considerably longer. Okay, so if we then use these direction cosines and we make them into sort of inclinations and declinations using the formula that I have below, um, you can actually make little arrow plots of them. And this was, I found was a really nice way to actually display these and compare these to the field. So if you look at the red arrows, they are the ambient field. That just, they're always going to be in the same direction everywhere because that's the, the field that we we look up in a table or whatever and we or online and we say this is the field direction for our model and the same case is in the, so that's the case for inclination on the left and declination on the right then the the yellow um ones they are the um they are the, the direction cosine version of the field that's the thing that we just calculated so if there's no remnants whatsoever we would expect the two to line up perfectly if they don't line up perfectly, then that's an indication that we're seeing remnants at certain points in the field. And for so I kind of like this a lot because this means that we can detect the presence of remnants in a field that's not so ambiguous. Um, you, 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 you can't, the direction cosines are not necessary enough to model with on their own, but at least you can see, yes, this anomaly has remnants and we may need to take that further, uh, either through measuring on the ground or making assumptions and seeing what we can get out of the equations later. So magnetization um, can be estimated um, um, for an assumed model and, and susceptibility. There are lots of uh, possibilities to calculate magnetization, um, and, but, um, but you do need to have a model in mind. Um, it's not a sort of, it does make assumptions and these assumptions can create inaccuracies. So for example, say, we're looking at the source detection model when we talk about, and I'm talking about this. And so for a dike where you have a width W, these different equations are all equivalent, more or less, um, and can be utilized to um, calculate the, the magnetization. And the bottom equation over here is then the remnant magnetization calculation. Um, so, so you're assuming things here, you're assuming the width of the body, you're assuming that you're dealing with the dike, you, you, um, and you assume that you know the susceptibility perfectly. And if you know these things, then you can calculate the remnant magnetization for this, for this body. Um, as you saw before, we can, we can calculate these, some of these things to varying degrees of accuracy. And if that is the case, and we've done a good enough job, then the remnant um, magnetization comes out. So over here, I did some tests. Um, so we, I had a dike that was 10 meters wide and 20 meters um, deep, um, and then it goes down for three kilometers to sort of simulate an, an infinite dike. And I had a small amount of susceptibility, and you can see the parameters for the ambient field down here. And what I wanted to do was actually compare what was the forward modeled version of the original parameters, meaning, meaning the direction cosines, inclination and direction, and magnetization, inclination and direction, and declination, sorry. And then the um, total magnetization and remnant magnetizations. And the results are actually quite nice in this particular case, he said, noting that it, he said in this particular case. And, but it does show that it's quite promising that even with all the assumptions and 
doom and gloom beforehand, it can actually work quite nicely under certain circumstances. So where does it not work so well? Well, apart from the modeling things, there is, an, there is a, another effect that comes into play, and that is that if there isn't enough remnants or the Q ratio is too low, then the estimation of these parameters kind of gets a lot more inaccurate. So you can see over here on the top row that the Q ratio is quite strong and the inclination and declination actually model quite closely. But as the Q ratio decreases, it gets more and more inaccurate. As, as it goes by. But still, if the, if the Q ratio is high enough, that's when you're mostly concerned about it. So it's still, it's still a useful starting point. So now we want to put all this into play. Um, I'd like to thank David, Dr. David Clark at the CSRO for providing me with some tensor data so that I could actually test some of these things out. Um, and this is a survey that was done in the early 2000s along um, in the Talawang magnetite deposit. It's 18 kilometers north of Gilgon, New South Wales. Along the, it's along the western margin of the Carboniferous Gilgon granite. Um, and the scan was intruded during the late stages of the uh, Canimblin erogenium um, in the late Carboniferous, Carboniferous. But if you're like me, in this case, my geology is not my, if you want strong geology, go to my wife, Janine. Um, but in, I'm sort of more interested in here, we have a dike-like feature. And this bit is high, and that bit is low, and there's my inclination. That's what I wanted to, that's what I was interested in. So this, as I said, was done um, in the early 2000s um, using the CSRO um, GetMag system. It's a ground-based system. And they also did a high resolution total magnetic intensity data survey using two CSM vapor magnetometers. Um, they, I think they used two for quality control purposes. And you can see on the left-hand side, they did a number of lines over the, over the deposit. Um, the, and then the field here is the total magnetic intensity field. And the one line that I'm going to be looking at in the talk today is line number 60. So how did we compare things? Well, um, what I did is I took the line data, and you can see here, here is the measured data set. And then I and using the information about the dike and, the, and what had been published before about the inclination of the dike and things like that, um, I made a synthetic module uh, model. Um, and you can see here, there is the model. And over the actual dike feature, it works quite well. Away from the feature, there's some other stuff happening in the data. I wasn't so interested in that, so that didn't bother me too much. Um, and so the point of doing this was to say, OK, let's have um, let's have an, an ideal case where there is no noise, where everything is perfect, where I understand exactly what I put in and what I'm getting out. And then we compare it to the real tensor data and see how well all of these things compare. So on the left-hand side, you can see the model data. This is forward model based on the model that I've just shown you, and it all looks very smart and spiffy. It's all nice and smooth and everything looks lovely. Now we have a look at the tensor data. And the tensor data looks a bit different in places. So um, it's, it's not too bad, but it's different enough to make me sort of think, hmm, this is not going to be quite as simple as I had hoped. Um, so you can actually see over here, this large spike-like feature here is, um, I think it actually relates to, oh wait, let me just go back to this peak over here. So it's something that I'm not interested in. Um, but other than that, the, the shape of the anomaly does mirror, uh, mirror nicely um, a lot um, the calculated features. So I can actually show you there, corresponding to there. It all seems to line up relatively well. Um, if we now then utilize all of this information and we get depth results, the true depth of the feature is around about 20 meters. On the baseline model, the top two um, images are the calculated analytic signals. Um, and the bottom image over here is um, the resultant depths. And you can see a lot of the depths calculated were actually quite close to 20 meters. There was one that was, a, um, was at 15 meters, but generally speaking, it actually gave results that were, that were reasonable as far as for, from what I could see. On the right-hand side, it looks a lot more messy, but if you look at the bottom, once again, the depth estimates in this particular case work quite nicely. There was one that was a bit far off and interestingly enough, it's the same one as what we saw in the synthetic model. Um, but other than that, it actually worked okay getting the depths. If I look at the first order analytic signal and the second order analytic signal results, now um, for the ideal case where there's no noise, everything is lovely and wonderful from the forward model, um, the true depth is at 20 and it actually works still reasonably well for a whole of the solutions. But on the right hand side, it doesn't. And the main reason here, as you can see um, in the, the calculation of the second order analytic yes. signal, it's just too noisy. What? Junior uh, said the contract, sorry. Is it? Oh, good. Uh, 
I'm sorry, I think there's a microphone on there. But um, okay, apart from that, so you can see down here that the, the depths actually um, were uh, between minus 50, around about 50 meters down, which is way too low. So there is, a, there is one of the reasons why the second order analytic signal is not always the best thing. But and once again, it might be fine if the actual, if the data is, is, um, is, is maybe a newer data set, more modern technology, and, and is not as noisy. So if we look, um, this there is a way to calculate depth if you know the susceptibility. So you can actually do that. Um, I did it in this particular case. Um, and um, it actually worked reasonably well. The depth, uh, the dark width is, um, oh, this is the width of the dark, sorry. And the dark width is supposed to be 10 meters. And it actually works reasonably well to get to 10 meters. On the measured data, it went down to about 17 meters. So that's a bit wide. Um, so, but it's still, um, approaching the right region. This will not as good a result, but it shows promise. So now if we calculate susceptibility, um, this, this remember is one of, the, um, one of the calculations that requires certain input assumptions that you make. This is true susceptibility is 2.5 SI. In the case of the modeled data, um, it does range a bit between two and just over two and a half, but it's, um, some of these solutions are actually quite nicely in the right ballpark. In the case of the Talawang data set, um, the solutions actually were all a bit high. Um, the most of the solutions, though, lie between three and four SI, which is considerably higher, but still they cluster together. Um, and so it shows promise for the future. Two of the solutions were really far off, though, um, as you can see over there. They didn't make any sense whatsoever. Same thing with the magnetization, the same trends are basically followed. Um, when uh, the calculation for the magnetization under the assumptions made, interestingly enough, um, in the case of the synthetic model, the estimates are actually all a little bit low. In the case of the actual uh, measured data, the estimates are all a little bit high, but probably closer to the solution. Um, so, so yeah, so um, moving on from there, if we look at the arrow plots to see um, how easily or not so easily the, the remnants was detectable, the baseline model for, um, for the declination doesn't really show much that kind of makes sense because in this particular case the declination between the, the remnant declination and the field declination were very very similar um oh sorry the inclinations rather um but in terms of the measured, measured data you actually start to see um some of the resultant calculations move away from the ambient field and this is kind of interesting as i said before these calculations should be pretty robust they don't make any assumptions whatsoever so that might indicate that there is a level of complexity in the data that that is a bit different from what we so what we're assuming to be the the dark um this feature over here on the left hand side here where i'm circling with my laser pointer thingy is um considerably different and that is a different part of it so that actually shows maybe there's a bit more complexity to this than maybe we we first understood this is the same plot but for declinations the declinations show a little bit of separation in terms of the actual model and then in terms of the measured data it actually can look quite a bit different um, now i mean i've said that these particular calculations are robust obviously if if the they do rely on the data not being so noisy so um there's a lot of equations that are going into it so if there's noise in the data that could affect the quality of the calculation so that's something that one must always consider but if the data is fine then the then the results actually should um give a good indication that you have a starting point to say okay maybe in this anomaly we need to be thinking about something else so that's basically what I wanted to present um, is concluding remarks is I kind of felt like there was a lot of possibilities for tensor data. I think that there's more data that's necessary for future research, but it, it is quite exciting. And I'm hoping that um, given what I've shown in the talk today, that people will start thinking that maybe that there's a lot more we can do with this data that's, that, that is possible. Um, I'm doing it your way, Charlie. So in terms of um, source detection, um, the, the tensor data does give a viable alternative to conventional methods. Um, there's a possibility of looking at directional components um, in terms of the depth calculations. I think more work has to be done on that. Um, but once again, I'm, you know, better quality is, data is necessary for future testing and so forth. Remnants is, um, is especially sensitive to noise and susceptibility estimates. But the direction cosines are robust since they make no assumption. I think remnants is an ex is a is an exciting part of the of the collection of tensor data, and I think especially in the South African context where we have a lot of it in certain deposits, it's um, something that may be worth looking at. 
So that is my talk. I'd like to thank you all for, um, for listening to me. Um, and once again, thanking the Council for Geoscience for um, having patience with me and, and supporting me when I was doing this. And thanking all the people that were, that were involved in um, when I asked questions and so forth. Thank you very much. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks.